China's commitment to allowing market forces to play a larger role in determining movements, movements in its exchange rate. This is an absolutely fundamental advance for the G20 in dealing with one of the underlying causes of the crisis in 2008. The G20 agreed that monetary policy should continue to support the economic recovery and every G20 country has put on the table specific structural reform commitments to strengthen global demand, foster job creation and increase growth potential. Vitally for Britain, this includes measures to help complete the European single market. On trade, we reaffirmed our commitment to avoid any new protectionist measures until at least the end of 2014 and to roll back any that have arisen. We committed to maintain a supportive business environment for investors. It was clear in our discussions that recent behaviour by Argentina on both trade and investment were not acceptable. The University of Toronto yesterday produced a detailed analysis of the extent to which each G20 has met its commitments since the last summit in Cannes. And I think this is important. We come to these summits, we make these commitments, we say we're going to do these things, and it is important as an organisation that checks up who has done what. And I'm proud to say, for the record, that Britain was top of this particular uh, league table, uh, and you can see who came bottom. Finally, in the margins of this summit, the US and Europe reached a groundbreaking political agreement to move forward with a deep but credible trade agreement by the end of 2014. This is significant. The EU and US together uh, account for over half the world's GDP. I've long believed that if we can get a proper free trade agreement between the EU and the US, it could make a huge difference to all our economies. And there's a very encouraging statement that has been put out today uh, by the EU and the US. Completing a deal here could provide an enormous boost to growth across the world, and that would of course mean jobs and growth in Britain. Turning to Syria, in the margins of the summit I had discussions with President Obama, President Putin, Chancellor Merkel, President Hollande, and Prime Minister Erdogan. Syria is descending rapidly into a bloody and tragic civil war, with potentially irreparable consequences for its people and the future. There is little time left to resolve this. But we do now have clear agreement on the key principles, on the risks to Syria, on the need to stop the violence, and the urgency of a political transition from the dreadful situation of today to a future where its people can once again make their voices heard and choose their own government. Now, of course, there remain differences over sequencing the exact shape of how the transition takes place. But it is welcome that President Putin has been explicit he is not locked into Assad remaining in charge in Syria. What we need next is an agreement on a transitional leadership which can move Syria towards a democratic future which protects the rights of all its communities. At the same time, it makes no sense for any country to be supplying arms to a regime that is killing its own people with mortars, snipers and attack helicopters. Now, we put in place a strong EU arms embargo. We are closely tracking other shipments to Syria and want to work with countries and companies around the world to stop them. So it is good news that the shipment of attack helicopters that we've been tracking in the North Sea in recent days is now heading away from Syria, but we must continue to work to stem the flow of weapons. So I believe we've made some important progress here at this summit, both on the global economy and on Syria. There are very significant challenges remaining. The test is now for countries to see through the agreements that we've reached, and Britain, as I've said, will continue to do just that. Thank you very much. Happy to take some questions. Start with Adam Bolton. Uh, Prime Minister, do you think uh, your confrontation with uh, President Kirshner has uh, improved or damaged uh, Britain and the, Argenti and the Falkland Islanders' uh, case in the eyes of the world? And for the record, what is your answer to Argentina's assertion that the appropriate place to settle this matter is discussions at the UN Decolonisation Committee? I just think it is very important for the good of the Falkland Islands and frankly for the long-term good of this whole issue, as you say, in the eyes of the world, for people to focus on the decision the Falkland Islanders themselves have made, which is to hold a referendum about their future. Because at the heart of the United Nations Charter is the idea of self-determination. All the countries involved in, in, in this dispute say that they believe in democracy, say that they believe in human rights, say that they believe in self-determination. Now, the people of the Falkland Islands are going to vote in a referendum. And I, would, I want to put this issue beyond doubt. I want to put this issue beyond doubt for Argentina, for the people of the Falkland Islands, 
and also for all the international gatherings that endlessly happen uh, and endlessly are, there's endless language proposed to try and uh, change the terms of this issue. And I think this referendum is a very important moment, so I wanted to raise it specifically with the Argentine president and say it's important that everyone pays attention to this referendum. So I think it was the right thing to do. Uh, I think it's right to stand up for the people of the Falkland Islanders, Falkland Islands, and I think it's very important to put this issue beyond doubt. It is the 30th anniversary. It's important that people understand how strongly the Falkland Islanders feel, but also how staunch Britain will be in defence of their rights. Nick Robinson. Nick Robinson, BBC News. Prime Minister, what do you say to those people who suggest it was a stunt, though, that effectively you wanted to please the newspapers and voters back home and therefore picked a fight with President Kirshner? And on another matter, if I may, you were in a meeting with the Eurozone countries tonight and uh, with President Obama. Are you clearer about the next measures they may announce, the form of bailouts that might be agreed for Eurozone countries whose banks and debt problems continue? Well, first of all, um, I just think it, it was an important conversation to have. Um, this referendum, I think, is something of a game changer for this issue. Uh, and I think it's very good that it's coming about. And I think we should be clear that because there's a referendum, there's a, a chance for those countries in the world that have not looked at this issue for a while and perhaps have accepted some of the propaganda put around by Argentina or their supporters, it's an opportunity for them to look again at this issue and recognise that the people of these islands should be able to determine their own future. So I felt this was an important point to make to the Argentine president and an important point to make more widely, and that's exactly why I did uh, what I did. No other reason um, than that. On the issue of what we discussed in the, the Eurozone, European Union, uh, US uh, meeting. Uh, what I've sensed at this summit is that there is a fresh impetus uh, with the Eurozone members in terms of using all the mechanisms, institutions and firepower that they have uh, to stand up and support uh, their currency. And I think that is very important in terms of trying to deal with the uncertainty that there is in um, financial markets. Obviously there were a lot of discussions about the Eurozone at this summit and I think what came out quite clearly is the Eurozone members are going to very strongly uh, defend their currency and take all the necessary measures to put its future beyond doubt. Uh, and I think that, is, uh, that was what we discussed at the meeting and I think you'll see uh, President Obama make a pretty strong statement uh, to, along those lines as well. Gary Gibbon. Thanks. You talked about a fresh impetus there, looking forward to next week and the end of next week. You're probably not looking forward to it much at all, really. But will you go to uh, Brussels banging the table uh, uh, in particular, because some of this uh, fresh impetus is coming from something uh, called the banking union, and uh, will you be asking for what you asked for in December and expecting a different response? Britain, I think, is playing a very constructive role in this. We're saying, look, we're not in the single currency, we're not going to join the single currency, but we understand that the single currency has a remorseless logic, which means that if it's going to work properly, it's got to have uh, a central bank that stands behind it, a banking union uh, that uh, backs it up, uh, fiscal transfers between stronger and weaker uh, member states to, to make more sense of it. It needs the features of the single currency as we have in the pound sterling or a single currency as we have in America with the dollar. So we've got a totally intellectually you know, strong and coherent case about what needs to be done, but we're also being uh, very clear about the defense of the British national interest, which is that our membership of the European Union is every bit as legitimate, every bit as important as anybody else's, and our interests in the European Union are making sure uh, that we are full members, making sure that we're full members of the single market, that the single market is safeguarded. And so, of course, as these steps go ahead, it'll be very important to make sure that those interests are properly safeguarded, and I will always do that, as I did uh, last um, December. So it won't be a question of banging the table. It's a very rational debate that's going to be how the Eurozone members go ahead safeguarding their currency and how those countries not in the Eurozone safeguard their interests. I don't think it's beyond the wit of man to find a, um, a, a, a sensible set of arrangements to, to, to do that, and that's exactly what I'll be trying to do. We've only got time, I'm afraid, for one more. Chris Ship from ITV. Two more if they're short. 
Thank you, Prime Minister. I'll try and keep this short, then. Um, there were two women with whom you did not see eye to eye uh, at this summit. One was over the Falklands, the other uh, was over the need to get her country's financial might right behind the Eurozone. Of those two women, which one is going to come round to your way of thinking first? Um, well, I certainly had a very uh, enjoyable conversation with Angela Merkel because at the trade lunch we, we used a number of uh, modern means of communication to keep up with the football and I can certainly say that it's a lot better watching uh, England play football sitting next to Chancellor Merkel when we're both cheering for the same side as we, as we were. So uh, we have a very good relationship and uh, a, a shared... Uh, I, although I gather if we win our next match and if Germany wins its next match, it could be England-Germany on the night of the European Council meeting, which I think will mean there may be some banging of the tables um, in that, to that regard. Look, with all these conversations, I think it's very important to stand up for your national interests, but also to try and build uh, strong uh, relationships. That's exactly what I've done at this summit. I have a very strong relationship with Angela Merkel. I admire her uh, as a politician and as a leader. I don't think it's right to place all the woes of the Eurozone at the door of one leader, as I've said. I think it's very important to understand the political pressures that other leaders are under, clearly for Germany to take some of the steps that those of us who believe you need change in the Eurozone uh, require. Some of those steps are politically difficult, and we have to show understanding uh, of that. And I think, um, as I say, our relationship is, is strong enough to, to withstand some frank debates about these issues. Uh, Tom Newton done, and then I've got to uh, catch an aeroplane. Very quickly, Prime Minister, just what if you had a message to uh, the England football team on their qualification to the next stage? And secondly, have you changed your views on gold, side, gold mouth technology uh, since the end of the game? Um, uh, I, my message is uh, congratulations. Uh, I think they've, they've shown incredible pluck and courage in the way that they've fought this campaign so far. And it's great that they're going through uh, from the group round undefeated. Um, and I think uh, it was a great, from what I saw, obviously not watching all of the match, uh, from what I saw it was a very good um, team effort and I wish them well for the, for the next round um, and uh, for the game against Italy. Um, goal line technology, uh, I remember thinking it was a thoroughly good idea when Frank Lampard uh, was disappointed um, in that previous England-Germany game. Now I, I will, um, I'll have to reflect a little bit further, but... Um, don't expect an immediate U-turn. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, and uh, see you in Mexico City.